Hello, everyone. Welcome to Heads Up, the weekly podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, migraine strategist, founder of the Facebook group Migraine Nation, and chronic daily migraine survivor. I am here with Dr. Vincent Martin. He is the director of the Headache and Facial Pain Center at the University of Cincinnati, and he is also the president of the National Headache Foundation. Hello, Dr. Martin. How are you doing today? Good, Lindsay. I'm doing great. All right. Our topic today is aura, migraine with aura. 20% of those of us with migraine experience migraine with aura. We want to talk about what aura is, why do we get them, uh, when should we be worried? If there is an aura symptom that's worrisome, migraine auras are usually visual, but they can also be sensory or motor or verbal. So we're going to talk about all those types of aura. So the first question I have is, what is it that we think causes aura exactly or leads to an aura? Well, an aura occurs because of a wave of electricity that goes along the surface of the brain. And that's called, what we think it's called is cortical spreading depression, although we're not 100% sure that happens in humans. Mm -hmm. But this wave, when it involves the, the visual cortex or the part, the cortex that involves the, the vision, you'll get a visual aura. When it involves the sensory cortex, that's the, that's the part of the brain that's involved in, in, in feeling. Then you get a sensory aura. And when it involves the motor cortex, which is as necessary for motor function, or strength of your arm or leg, then you get uh, another kind of aura called um, a motor aura. Okay. Uh, so in which phase of our migraine do we usually experience aura? I mean, we know that we've got a few phases. We've got a prodrome, we've got the attack phase, we've got the postdrome. Uh, so which phase do we usually experience an aura in? Well, the first phase of, of the headache is, is gonna be the prodrome. And people can get like some symptoms, um, early symptoms that they're going to have headaches. They might be extremely fatigued. They might have neck pain. They might have sensitivity to light and noise. Um, they may not uh, be able to remember things quite as well. They may get dizziness uh, during the prodrome. And then um, after that comes the aura phase. But the aura phase only occurs in a small minority of patients, only in about 15 to 30%. So not everyone gets an aura. So uh, consequently, um, during the, the, after the aura phase is the headache phase, which is where you get the head pain and the nausea and the vomiting and so forth. And then finally, there's something called the postrome, which is kind of a recovery phase where you can be very fatigued. Uh, sometimes you can have, um, you can urinate a lot during that uh, period as well. So there's really five different phases of a migraine attack. Okay. Um, do or, does aura always precede the headache phase or can it sometimes come during the headache phase? Well, classically, they, they say that the aura occurs before, and I would say that's probably the most common pattern, but there can be some people that will develop auras right when the headache phase begins. Mm -hmm. and some may even develop it midway into the headache phase. So um, it's commonly thought that it occurs before, but it occur can occur during other, other phases as well. Is it possible to experience aura without head pain? Yes, uh, that occurs more commonly in patients as they age. In fact, there can be some uh, elderly or older patients who start developing, say, a visual aura in later life, and they may not have ha any headache at all, and they may not, may not have had any past history of migraine whatsoever. So, and that's called late life accompaniments, which is kind of a funny way to, to describe that. But that can occur in, in headache patients as well. You can have a person that has migraine attacks that don't have any aura, and then you can have some that just have an aura but no headache, and you can have some that have an aura plus a headache. So there can be all sorts of different combinations of, of aura in patients. Okay, so let's start by talking about visual auras because I believe those are the most common and that's what people most usually think of when they think of aura. So how are visual auras usually described? Well, actually I get one myself. So what happens is I'll start off seeing this like real small little speck in my vision and it'll kind of flash and so forth and then it gradually gets bigger and it gets bigger to the point it becomes kind of crescent shaped. Mm -hmm. and it's usually in, in my the outside part of my vision and it, it at its worst extent when i hold my finger up i can't even see my finger 
Right. So uh, that's how I would uh, describe it. There are other people who describe it as like little uh, flashing lights or stars. Mm -hmm. However, a common misconception is that uh, people say, well, I have an aura. And I'll say, well, what, can you describe that for me? And they'll say, well, I get little flashes of light. And I'll say, well, how long do they last? They say, just for a second. That's mm -hmm. not an aura. So an aura has to last a characteristic duration. Classically, it lasts anywhere from five to 60 minutes. Okay. But there can, you know, there can be situations where the aura lasts much longer than that. There could be some instances where it may last hours or even days, and, and even rarely could last, last for weeks. Right. I think that my most common one that I always think of, I've had it since I was very young child, and I always just thought it was normal. And I always describe it as it looks like jellyfish with no legs. It's just these little things in my vision. And it's been the same one since I was very young. I do get some different ones. But that's my most common one. <laughs> um, so what is a scotoma? A scotoma is a blind spot in the vision. And that I see that too, but I see the little blind spot and then around it is like this geometric shape. And then that gradually gets larger to where it becomes that crescent shaped uh, image that I described before. But that's, that's a scotoma and that's another uh, form of visual aura. Okay. All right, so let's move to sensory aura. What is a sensory aura? And what do people most commonly describe those as feeling like? Well, a sensory aura can either be tingling or numbness of one part of the body. It might uh, start on the face and then march down to the arm and then march finally down to the hand. And that's the one thing that distinguishes an aura from say uh, a TIA or stroke, TIA is transient ischemia attack, that's where there's low blood flow to the brain, is that the symptoms of an aura tend to march. So whether it's a visual aura where it starts off small and then gradually gets bigger, mm -hmm. or whether the sense sensation of a sensory aura starts in one location and moves to another, whereas a stroke, you would have all the symptoms at exactly the same time. Okay. So that's an important distinguishing feature, but that's the way that they would, that many patients describe a sensory aura. Okay. Um, what is a dysphagic aura? Well, that's uh, simply where patients start to slur their speech. Right. They might be talking and they might start garbling, going like this, and you may, it may be completely unrecognizable. Um, and uh, that would be considered a speech aura. Okay. And we do have an entire podcast episode on speech problems related to migraine. If you look back at our previous episodes, so um, we go into that in depth. Um, and now you already answered this question, but let's bring it up one more time. How long do auras usually last? Well, they have a characteristic duration when they occur typically. And I said before, they can last you know, longer than that, but they usually are five, five to 60 minutes is the, is the classic duration of an aura. Okay. And um, do some people experience multiple types of aura at once? Yes. Uh, some people will have a visual aura and then they might have along with that, they may have a sensory aura. And then some people may even have the whole tamale. They'll get the motor aura and they'll get the sensory aura and the, the visual aura in the same attack. So they, you can have different types of aura that occur with the same migraine. Yes. Okay. So let's touch on this for really quickly. There is a very unique type of migraine called hemiplegic migraine. And let's talk about the types of auras that you are unique to hemiplegic migraine. Well, the aura that occurs with hemiplegic migraine is, is, a, is a motor loss. So patients will get either paralysis or they'll get weakness of say, their face, their arm, or their leg. Um, and that can um, be very distressing because the first time that happens, um, you don't think of it as a migraine. You're probably thinking that you're having a stroke. Um, but once again, one of the main distinguishing features is the fact that the symptoms kind of march. They start off in one location and then go to another. But I would say that if you have a motor aura or what we call hemiplegic migraine, that at least with the first episode until you've been diagnosed, you probably should seek immediate medical attention because really it can be diff difficult to differentiate from a stroke. Right. So other than these auras that occur with hemiplegic migraine where you probably should seek medical attention, let's really quit going back over the auras that we have discussed. Um, are there any symptoms 
where you would say go to the ER because I do know that people, when they get a new aura symptom, they sometimes become afraid. Um, so at what point do you think they should seek medical attention? Well, I, if, if they have something that sounds like what we described as a visual aura, then I would not recommend people going to the emergency room for a visual aura. That would be, you'd be sending countless people to the <laughs> ER. Um, and visual auras are very, are very common. Mm -hmm. uh, the sensory aura and the motor aura are a little bit different, um, um, and even the speech aura, because when it happens for the very first time, you don't really have any history. It's never happened before. You don't know what you're dealing with. Um, so those, in, in those instances, you might want to consider going to the ER if it's the first time. Once you've been diagnosed with hemiplegic migraine, and it's happened 15 or 20 times, or once you've been diagnosed with a sensory aura and you know what it is, you know it's not a stroke or TIA, mm -hmm. and, uh, then you don't run to the ER each and every time with those, with those symptoms. So it really depends on whether you've been diagnosed um, or not and, and how confident you are that it was an aura and not a stroke or TIA. Okay. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to add to our conversation on aura? Well, I think there's a number of interesting things about aura. Um, number one is that patients with aura seem to be more sensitive to trigger factors. So there's something about patients that have aura which make them a little bit different than those that do not have auras. Um, auras can occur in women around the menstrual period, although they're probably less common. So the, the headaches that are called menstrual migraines in women that occur two days before or two days after, in most instances are going to be migraine without aura, although occasionally they can be migraine with aura. Um, and there can be a, a slight um, increased risk of, of other medical illnesses with aura as well. So it, it tends to be a disorder that's a little bit more severe than migraine without aura. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And that concludes our conversation on Aura. I hope everyone found that helpful. And please join us again next week for Heads Up, the weekly podcast of the National Headache Foundation.